Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring psychological trauma and the soul. My guest is Reverend Dr. Karen Herrick, who is an interfaith minister as well as a psychologist. She is the author of The Psychology of the Soul and the Paranormal. She has also written Grandma, What is a Soul? and You're Not Finished Yet. This is an internet interview, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Karen. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So you have a psychological practice where you're working with children of alcoholics, people with eating disorders. In, in general, I, it seems as if your specialty is people who have been traumatized. Yes, uh-huh. And I don't work so much with young children anymore. Some adolescents. Um, uh, I work with adults who were raised in dysfunctional or alcoholic families. And interestingly, you came from such a family yourself. I did, uh-huh. So that gives you, uh, I, I have to imagine, an enormous amount of empathy. And not only that, you're probably a role model because uh, here you are, a successful therapist, and your clients who are struggling can see that if, if you can pull your way out of the trauma that you've been through, so can they. That's right. And that, I like that. I like to be a role model for them. One of the interesting things about your approach, which is transpersonal, it's, uh, it's getting people in touch with what you call their soul, the spiritual component of, of themselves, where there is an enormous healing resource. Yes, I believe that uh, spiritual psychology works the best for people, that they should know they have a soul and um, that their purpose in life comes from the soul. And as Jung said, that was what you were supposed to do, was to figure out um, what your soul purpose was. You point out that because of your own childhood and early marriages uh, involving, uh, you know, repeated exposures to alcoholism and abuse, you had kind of given up on the idea of uh, the soul or God or, or or anything redeeming. Life seemed pretty ugly. Well, yeah, I didn't really believe there was a God, um, because a child at about eight years of age decides that um, whether God's there or not, depending on, um, you know, what their parents have done, uh, how, uh, if what religious instruction they have given the child. So um, my father was Protestant, my mother was Catholic, and she was pregnant with me when they got married, or they got married after, it depends which story you believe. And... Um, so I went to a Protestant church, but my father was the alcoholic, so he would take us to church and then uh, Sunday school, and then he'd go to a bar, and then when it was time to pick us up, where was he, you know? And so luckily in this little town where we went to church, Kinderhook, New York, we um, I had an aunt, a great aunt, and so we would walk down to her house, and she would call my mother and say, you know, he hasn't picked them up yet, and um, so, you know, God was like, I, I figured God really wasn't interested in us because... You know, we were such a mess. I knew we were a mess uh, by the time I was eight or nine, I'm sure. In many ways, it's pretty clear that you suffered throughout your childhood. Uh, but the interesting thing uh, from a larger perspective is, is that if you look at, let's say, American culture, but this is probably true around the world, the, the percentage of people who suffer from childhood abuse and various forms of addictions and uh, mental illness in their families is, is relatively high. I have to think it may affect 30, 40, maybe 50 percent of the population. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there are statistics as high as 80% of the population, but that's, you know, that's pretty high. I mean, dysfunction is normal. That's what people need to know. It's just on, on what level of dysfunction were you? And the people that are really happy, um, I don't know where they live because they don't come here, you know. Um, so, you know, 
I just see the ones that um, came from a dysfunctional or alcoholic home. And really, they're very idealistic and they want um, they want to be the best they can be. They want to be the best parent they can be. And uh, so that's what they do. They, they come in and we talk about, you know, all the stuff that they think that they're not. And then that helps because it brings it to the light. And um, that's spiritual in itself. And then we, um, you know, we, we look at their goals and what kind of things they want to do. Well, one of the statistics that I find very interesting as a parapsychologist is that when you interview people who have had spontaneous psychic experiences, spiritual experiences, paranormal experiences, um, the percentage of people who have experienced childhood trauma of one type or another is, is really quite high. I think higher, uh, than the uh, population overall. Yes. Well, Kenneth Ring did that study. Um, uh, he wanted to know, he was studying near death experiences and he wanted to know why did this group have near death and this group of adults didn't have the near death. So, um, he took, um, you know, the group that didn't have it and that did have it made a control group. And he found out that the people that had the near death experiences had come from a dysfunctional home where they, um, had disassociated in their childhood. So instead of being in math class where you're afraid you can't do it anyway, you're thinking about the beach. And so that's what they would do. And, um, so they could disassociate easier and faster than most people. And then in adulthood, the gift that you get is that, um, is that you can have a spiritual experience easier than someone. So if you're in a car accident, you can leave and have a near death experience because you're used to disassociating. How did that work out for you in your own uh, growth? Let's see. So I, I married at 18. I was pregnant like my mother and, um, that I got married and that a relationship marriage lasted about 11 years and I had two girls and then I remarried eventually and I had another daughter. And so I, you know, the soul growth in a lot of our lives are just being the father and the mother to our children and doing what we think that we're supposed to do normally. And so that's what I did. And then when I realized that I was married to an alcoholic, um, I didn't want to be like my mother. And so I thought I can't stay here. Um, and I tried and I tried and I tried to, um, to help him see, <laughs> like, uh, everybody at Al-Anon can relate to my story, I'm sure. And I wanted him to see that, um, you know, that he had a problem. And one night we were fighting and it's amazing because when you fight with an alcoholic, I don't know about other people, but his eyes weren't even there. You know, he was glazed over and, and he stopped in the middle of the argument and he goes, uh, let me tell you something. And he said, and if you tell anybody, he said, I'll deny this. But he said, you, I can live without alcohol. I can't. And that, I mean, I felt like I was slapped in the face, of course, but what I realized was that's what I was afraid of. I was afraid that he wasn't going to be able to give up alcohol, and there it was, and he told me the truth, you know? So um, that's when I decided I was going to have to leave, and I was going to have to get a plan, and so I went back to college, and um, I uh, I went to the women's center at college, and they said, um, I said, I don't know what I want to do. Do I want to, when I get this divorce, do I want to go to work? Because I'm a secretary, and I type over 100 words a minute, and I can do that. But I, I think I want to go to school. So they put me in this room that had all these pictures of women on the walls. And um, it was interesting. I'd never been in a room like that before. And I had like an inch booklet. Um, and the first question was, if you could do anything you wanted to do, and had all the time in the world, what would you do? And so I said, I would go to college. And then it took me 45, 50 minutes, and I did the whole booklet. And then at the end, um, it said, go back to page one and do it anyway. So I decided, all right, I'm going to start. I'm going to go to school. And, you know, it, it took two years to divorce him because he didn't want to get divorced. Alcoholics don't like to be alone, um, and they don't like you to ruin their image. So it was very difficult to divorce him, and I finally did. Um, and by that time, I think I had, um, I had almost a bachelor's. And so I have an art, an AA in, in humanities and a bachelor's in, um, art with art therapy. So I started studying Jung then. And then I have a master's, went on to get my master's in social work. And then years later, I got a PhD in spiritual psychology, which 
I had a spiritual experience and, um, I'm not sure if my dysfunction helped me do that. I was, I was at a conference and, uh, I was supposed to be learning about the chakra system, which I knew nothing about. And so they said by Wednesday, we're going to lay down and we're going to, um, breathe to music. And so, um, I, I thought, oh, okay. So I didn't know holotropic breath work, but, and, and I, you know, I was active. When, when you tell me you're going to educate me, I'm there. So, uh, I lay down and they get, did a meditation and then they said, um, don't think, just breathe. So we breathed in and then we breathed out forcefully, you know, in the count of four and then out as far as you could go. So it's like the Vegas breath that I teach now. But uh, with the music and everything, it put me in an altered state of consciousness. And I, um, I, I felt another breath come into my body eventually. I, um, I was laying on pillows and blankets and I put up my legs in the birthing position. And I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but this other breath came into my vagina and out my mouth. And I thought, wow, I'm a channel. And so I think we are a channel for God and for spirit. Um, and then I just laid there and all kinds of things were happening in my body. And, um, I wish they had videoed it because I had all these feelings and you, the music's playing, you know, and, um, I was enjoying myself. And then I started to feel more chaos eventually. And, um, I asked my, uh, you have a partner who sits and, you know, uh, if you need water or something, they'll get it for you. And I asked him to push on my feet and, um, he, uh, he didn't do it right. So, the trainers came over and um, they pushed on my feet just right. And then another trainer went by my neck and um, I was holding, he said, hold on to my uh, wrist. And I did. And he said, um, now push and push. And I, so I, you know, was breathing and pushing and, and I thought, uh, what am I doing? And then I had the thought, where's my mother? And then I thought, don't think you have to breathe, just breathe. So I did. And then finally, um, it, it was over, whatever it was. And, um, they said I laid there like a little baby with my, my fist curled up next to my, um, face. And I, you know, I wish I could have seen that. I really do. And then you weren't supposed to do anything except stand up eventually and go and, uh, draw a mandala drawing. And so, um, when I stood up, I looked around the room and, I had met these 21 people just um, on Saturday or Sunday, and this was Wednesday, and I felt this love and awe and just beautiful feelings about them, And where I thought they were very weird when I first met them, because they, they believed in transpersonal and Jungian psychology, which I'd never heard of. And then I knew I was connected to them, and I knew we were connected to all the people in the world, and uh, I knew there was a God. And so... <laughs> that still um you know, sends a chills at me. But uh anyway, then I went and I drew a picture in a circle and it was um a flower and and the grass and the sun and and that was nice and then we're supposed to go eat. Now I thought this whole process had taken about twenty minutes, but actually it took four hours. So I was in this alter state a long time and, and um that's why I wish they had video it, videoed it. And maybe they do that now. I don't know in holotropic breathwork sessions, or maybe you could hire somebody. And maybe if you're videoed, you won't have such a, a unique experience, you know, because you're expecting to perform. But I just let go. And, um, and that's what happened. Well, it sounds like this was a major spiritual awakening for you. Not in the beginning, which is a lot of spiritual awakenings are not in the beginning because I was, Afterwards, um, after we had lunch, which grounds you, then I went and everybody showed their pictures, right? And so mine was my, and the teacher said, Oh, well, that's a rebirth. You had a rebirth. So that was it. And, and nobody else had a breath come through them and felt where was their mother. And so I didn't say a word, you know, cause adult children, we don't like to look, look dumb. So I thought, you know, I'll figure this out. And then by Saturday, I was supposed to drive some people. I lead them to Newark Airport from Connecticut, where we were. So um, I thought, Karen, you got to get this together. Because I didn't go out for pizza. I didn't leave the, um, it was a nunnery, a former nunnery. I didn't leave the grounds because I just felt like, 
Uh, I don't know what happened, but I, w- I was in probably the fourth dimension and the third dimension at the same time. And I thought, well, get it together and you're going to figure this out. So it took me a year or two. And um, I finally uh, read Bill Wilson's story, the founder of AA, and he talked about um, a breath of spirit that went through him. And I thought that's what I had. I had a breath of spirit. And um, how else would I feel that there is a God, you know? So really, it was attending this uh, transpersonal workshop on holotropic breathing that uh, made a uh, uh, a real turnaround in your life. Because then I started getting people that had really weird experiences like I had. Um, one of my clients told me that he left his body at night and he was afraid he wouldn't be able to get back in. I'd never been trained on that, even with the transpersonal stuff that I was doing. So I just said, well, how do you usually get back in? And he said, well, I just think about it and I'm there. And that's how you get back in your body. If anybody wants to get back in, if they're out there, you just think I want to be back there. And I am because that's apparently what works in the fourth dimension is thought. Um, and then um, uh, one of my clients, let's see, he came uh, for a relationship problem. He was about 29 and he was very scared. Um, and usually people are, you know, uncomfortable, but, and I type uh, while they're here and mostly that doesn't bother them because I tell them I'm perceptual, perceptually impaired from the incest that I had from my father. So I type over a hundred words a minute and I get at most everything that they say. So anyway, I put all that down because I said to him, you know, you're really afraid. Um, you seem very frightened and people are uncomfortable. So it's normal to be uncomfortable. But um, so I checked out at work. Was he afraid? It does, did his alcoholic father, um, you know, threaten him or, oh, no, no, we fight. But, you know, that's just normal stuff we do, uh, which there is a lot of fighting in an alcoholic home. So anyway, he wanted me to help him with his relationship problem. So he left. And when he came back a week or two later, he was just as afraid. So I said, Look, um, I think there's something you're not telling me. I never said this to another person. Um, and I need you and I are going to have to trust each other um, if, you know, we're going to work together. So if there's something that you're not telling me, please do it now, because I've heard a lot of weird stories. You can't believe what I've heard. And then I was thinking it's just what I went through, you know, a year ago. But anyway, he says, well, there was this one thing. And um, and I told my priest and my priest said I had to forget it to never talk to anybody about that again, because they would think I was crazy. And I said, oh, really? I said, no, I'm really interested. So tell me. So he said, well, well, he says what William James says. They say, I don't have the words to express this to you. And you're going to think I'm crazy when I do. But what happened to me was that I went home one night. My father's in the kitchen and um, he was fixing some food and there were knives on the chopping block. And, um, And we had a big fight and he picked up this knife and he threw it at me. And he'd never done that before. But he said, this is what happened. He said, it was like a piece of plexiglass and it came down in front of me and the knife bounced off of it. So I said, oh, wow. I said, so you had a spiritual experience. I said, now lots of people have those, um, but they don't always talk about them just for the reason your priest said. So you can, uh, luckily, I know a little bit about them and um it, it sounds like it was a force field. He said, yeah, it was. It was something. And um, so I said, well, can you forget it? Like your priest said. And he, he said, no. He said, I can't forget it. And I said, well, and you're 29 years old. And you might not want to do this with me right now because you didn't come here for that. But if you want a bibliography of books you can read where other people have had spiritual experiences, um, you know, I can, I can get that for you if you need it. So now that I know that, and I'm qualified to tell you that you're not crazy, I would think you'd feel better about coming here. And he just kind of fell into the chair. You know? um, all of his defense was gone and he didn't have to pretend that I guess he was normal, even though this crazy thing had happened to him. Yeah, you were relying on your intuition. Some inner prompting told you to push him on on that issue. Yes, because he was too afraid. We weren't going to get anywhere. Doesn't it ever occur to you to ask yourself, uh, you know, what is the purpose of this trauma? Why did I have to suffer so much as a child, as an innocent child in an alcoholic family? Well, not anymore, no. Uh, but when I'm sure I was on the pity pot a lot when I was... um. 
in both of my marriages. And why does this have to happen to me? That was probably the way I handled it. Um, but now I, I mean, as my father would say, I taught you a lot about studying alcoholism and he did. Um, and that was his ego, but, uh, you know, not anymore. I know that the trauma, we're here to suffer. Um, I don't think we're here to be happy. We're here to make our own happiness. Yes. But we're not given, you know, carte blanche that you're going to come in here and be happy because look at, look at all the dysfunction there is in the world. You're supposed to grow and you have a soul and you're supposed to feed it with all these information. And, and your parents, of course, set the pattern for that. Like my mother set a pattern that. I would stay in this marriage and, you know, that was my bed and I would sleep in it. And that's what was one of her famous statements. And um, so I was determined, nope, I'm not doing that. So eventually when I realized that he was going to choose alcohol over me, um, I, I made a plan and you have to make a plan. It, it takes about two years to get ready, I think, to get divorced. So a lot of your clients are people who um, come from the, these sorts of very unfortunate uh, homes and, and, and backgrounds, and your basic focus is to work with their spiritual experiences. That was not my basis, basic focus um, in the beginning. My, my focus was to find out what role they played in their family, because we have roles that children play, the hero, the scapegoat, the lost child, the mascot, the placator. And um, and how many roles did you play? And were you the only child? Maybe you played all of them. Um, so first I would teach them all that. And, and then what kind of problems do you have? Do you have problems in assertiveness? Do you have, do you use the victim role to get attention? Are you sick a lot? You know, uh, try to find all of that that came out of their, um, out of their life with their parents. Because as Jung said, you know, there's uh, five layers in your unconscious. The first layer is your life and what happened to you. The second layer is your parents' lives and how they affected you and what you do with that. You don't walk around for the rest of your life and say, poor me. That's not what you're supposed to do. And then the third uh, level of Jung's unconscious is uh, DNA and your um, ancestors. And um, sometimes he said that we are given jobs that our ancestors, um, let's see, uh, didn't complete. And so we're to complete them. So he believed in doing genealogy, which I also asked him about their family and their culture, you know, because the fourth layer was um, the culture that you came from or the country. And how did that affect you? Um, and then the last layer of his unconscious is your soul slash self. And so as you get through all of those layers of finding out what kind of a person you are, then you're ready maybe to look at yourself slash soul. One of the things I know that you pay attention to in, in your book, The Psychology of the Soul, is the, this whole notion of out-of-body experience. When I started to learn, I wanted to make things, um, and I was going to be the best therapist I knew how to be for people that came from alcoholic and dysfunctional homes. And I thought, I have to make things simple for these people because... Well, we use chronic shock then, and now that's PTSD, I think. Um, so people come to you and they're so confused and tired, you know, and they don't think that they have a purpose. They don't think they're smart, and they are. What I did with them then when I wanted to teach them is I made this chart about Carl Jung and the conscious part of us and the unconscious part of us and um, and about this um, – uh, the consciousness outside of our consciousness. And, and I, I taught them about psychology. I usually do that the first or second session so that they know a little bit about psychology. And even if they don't understand it, they say, uh-huh. And I give them the handout, you know? So um, anyway, I thought, you know, I send people and chronic grief uh, to mediums to, uh, you know, that I have gone to, or my friends have gone to. And so how can I make this simpler for them? You know, because they, they don't understand, well, she must look me up on Google or, you know, look my husband up and all that stuff, which I don't think so. And I don't think she has time to do that. Uh, so I was trying to figure out how does this work that mediums get information? Um, and that when I would go to psychics or mediums, I would get information and then I would, uh, I type under words a minute there and I take notes and then I'd see if it's, um, 
if it's, you know, come true and a lot of it has, and then I go back to the psychic that was the best. So I have to figure out actually what happens. So I, I studied the uh, history of mediumship and I gave a talk on that. And then, um, I had a client, uh, a few, you know, a potential client who called me and she said, um, that she had been praying for 90 days for God to change her life. And that, um, now she had bad spirits under her bed at night that were making horrible faces at her and doing all this horrible stuff. And, and that she had gone online and she got my name and the good spirits had told her I would help her. And at that time, somebody had asked me to do a talk on a medium, a medium. And I thought, well, I've already done the history of mediumship. What am I going to do now? So anyway, she's a recovering alcoholic and had a child and had parenting issues too. So, um, I said, well, uh, I have to meet you. So you'll have to come here and, um, then we'll talk and, and I'll take your case. You know, if when you come here, we, we both agree we like each other, we can work together. Um, and I'm not going to charge you if I use you because I have a, a talk to give in nine months and I'm going to use you whether you become a successful medium or not. I'm going to use this material to try to teach people in psychology about what happens, you know, um, when you have this gift because her grandmother, um, had had the gift and her grandmother, um, didn't really like the gift and didn't, uh, use it really. Uh, they played uh, tea leaves and stuff with the teacup. And then the grandmother would go to church probably on Sunday and, you know, confess to the priest that she had done this. And she always told this daughter that, um, or the granddaughter that this was just fun. We're just having fun. So she couldn't even hold on that she had a gift. So then I just started thinking about how does this happen? And then she really helped me and I really helped her. And, um, I learned about the making of a medium, and that's one of the chapters in the book. Somewhere along the line, it, you got the idea that it would be useful to consult with psychics and mediums. How did that begin? Well, that began when I lived in California, because people do that all the time in California. And that was fun. And they would have psychic fairs, and I would go with my girlfriends. And, you know, so I, I started doing that. Then I read Shirley MacLaine. So this is still while you're in a, a bad marriage with an alcoholic husband, as I recall. But it wasn't wasn't bad all the time, you know. <laughs> so yeah. So anyway, um, and then uh, I just started going to psychics and mediums. I read all of Shirley MacLaine's books, and um, and they made sense to me. And all the things that she was able to tell, reincarnation fascinated me. Um, so I started studying that and reading different books on that. Um, so, you know, I was, I was educating myself along with, you know, getting my degrees and, and of course they never mentioned this stuff, you know, in college. So, um, but it was the fun stuff to me. It really was fun. In your book, you talk quite a bit about the silver cord and out of body experiences and the vagus nerve. How did all of that begin for you? The vagus nerve, uh, Dr. Porges wrote a book called The Polyvagal Theory, and um, he was talking about how to help people with anxiety and panic. So I thought, well, that would be helpful. So I bought his book, 40 Years of Research. It wasn't that helpful <laughs> because it's a difficult book. So I, But I, I kept trying to learn it, and then I went to Cape Cod, and um, I had five mornings with him. And so I, I got that down. Um and then, then I went to the spiritualist town uh, called Lilydale in um, by Lake Erie, and um, and I found these um, illustrations that uh, Carol Barnett, who was a trance medium, she um, used these illustrations to teach other mediums at Lilydale and in Detroit, Michigan, um, about how mediumship worked. And that was my answer. <laughs> I was trying to figure that out, right? Now, she wrote a pamphlet, but I've never been able to find the pamphlet, and I don't think she sold very many. And, of course, me I don't know about mediums today, but mediums back there, they didn't date things. So it's very hard for me to find out um, the things that she wrote. Uh, but um, I did, in the um, museum at Lilydale, um, find some um, – there was a magazine that people got every two weeks and she did have some of her call. Uh, she wrote a column there and talked about the different chapters in her book. So I have gotten like maybe eight out of 10 of her chapters and most of them I talk about in my book. Um, 
And then she talks about the silver cord, which I, you know, had to study about and learn. Um, and the silver cord is part of the vagus nerve. And um, so that the soul, when it comes into your body, it is placed in your body by God as a, a piece of energy. And then your physical body wraps around your soul so that um, your your soul becomes a, uh, or your etheric body becomes a miniature of your physical body. And it goes up the vagus nerve uh, and out the silver cord uh, when you have an out-of-body experience, a near-death experience, or when you so-called die from this earth. Now, many uh, psychics report seeing the silver cord, but I know many others report that they don't see it. They look for a silver cord and can't find it if they're having an out-of-body e experience, which it suggests to me that maybe it's just a thought form or maybe there are different types of out-of-body experience, uh, different levels or layers, and some of them necessitate the silver cord and others do not. I think you have to be clairvoyant to see it. So I see that. I think that's why not a lot of people see it because they're not. And also they're seeing all this other stuff, you know, their religious figure, their, their grandparents, um, you know, brothers and sisters that have been miscarried or lost. Uh, you got all this other stuff going on. So I don't know how many people are actually looking for a cord that comes at the back of your neck. It's very interesting because it suggests that uh, we can understand the idea of the soul in terms of thinking of human anatomy and uh, the counterparts that might exist in a in a sort of spiritual anatomy that the, you use the phrase etheric body, I think, a little earlier, which, uh, as I understand, is comes out of theosophy. But there, there are these ways of thinking about it that are s sort of grand Grounded as being analogies to the physical body. It's, it's called a lot of things. And I mentioned, I don't know, maybe 12, 15 things in the book that it is called, which is one of the problems with spirituality is we have all these names. And, you know, we need really to get some kind of a, a dictionary of, okay, let's put all those 12 names and call it the astral or etheric body. But let's pick one. Not likely to happen when you consider, you know, there's, there's no overarching, uh, organization to enforce just one. The, the whole field of psychology, let alone the field of spirituality is fractured into dozens of different schools of thought, each with their own vocabularies. Yes, that's the problem. One of the problems. <laughs> <laughs> One of the many problems. Uh, now, it, it, I'd also like to go back to a comment you raised earlier, Karen. You mentioned that as a child, you had suffered from incest, uh, which, you know, sounds like a, a relatively severe trauma. How did you work through that? I had my first therapist lasted for years, um, five or six years, I think. And she su suggested once that I had been incested. And I said, no, at least that didn't happen to me. And then, of course, synchronicity, of course, enters again. And my grandmother had a farm in Kinderhook, New York. And I, um, I had lived at that farm with her when I was in eighth grade. And I stayed with my grandmother a lot. So these new people bought the farm and um, they called my mother because they knew that her mother-in-law had owned it and said they wanted somebody to come up and tell them, you know, how we use the rooms in the farm and blah, blah, blah. So since I do genealogy and um, I'm supposed to know all this family history, my mother said, you know, next time you come up, maybe you can go visit them. And I did. So this was right after my therapist said, you know, perhaps you'd been incested. Um <clears throat> So anyway, we go up the stairs of this big farmhouse, and uh, my grandmother had told me that um, there was, I'm getting the psychic chill. We can talk about that in a minute. Uh, my grandmother had told me that um, the maid's room uh, of the people who owned the house before her was right next to the bathroom. But the bathroom only worked in the summer, by the way. So anyway, I go over to the maid's room, and she had told me my father slept in that room as a kid, and that um, I slept in it. So anyway, there was this force field, talk about a force field, um, uh, covering the door. I couldn't go into that room. And I thought, ooh, and I, I heard my grandmother say that my father and I have both slept there as kids. So anyway, I took her across the hall to the room where I slept when I was in eighth grade. And I said, in this room, 
I used to sleep in and we had a bed, you know, with a headboard that went to the ceiling and blah, blah, blah. And I'm taking her all through the house. And then as I'm driving back from New York State to New Jersey, I think, you know, maybe that did happen to me, right? So I have to think about that. So anyway, then I had this neck problem uh, on my left side. And I, um, and when I was driving a car, I would have to turn my body to look to the left. I could not turn my neck like I can now. So uh, probably about a week after I was back, I was driving down Broad Street in Red Bank, and I turned my neck. And I thought, wow, the chiropractor is really doing his job. I can turn my neck. <laughs> so this is how mind-body works. Um, that was a body memory, turning my neck. So uh, Saturday night, I only had one daughter living with me then, and she was at a friend's house, which was good. I was, I would used to wake up at um, 4.20 in the morning, and my therapist and I had figured out that that's when my father would get home from the bar. The bar closed around 3, you know, he'd probably get out of there about 3.20, and he'd take an hour to get home. And that's when my parents would fight, and I would I would stay awake listening. My brothers never listened that I know of, um, but I would wait till they didn't fight, which was about five in the morning, and then I could go to sleep. So that's what kids are doing that are living in an alcoholic home. So anyway, I woke up. I'm the only one in the house, and I look at the clock, and it's four twenty. And um, after a while, I started to think that maybe that's when the incest happened. So I thought, oh, four twenty, isn't that funny? Then I had read years before that at MSW um, class about um, people that had these visions, hallucinations at night of the incest hap reoccurring. So I looked toward the door, just happened to look toward the door, and there was this man standing in the door that looked like my father. It was just a black form. And he was coming closer and closer to me. And I, I, I had a therapist part, and I had the kid part, and the kid was scared to death. And the therapist said, you live through this once, you can live through this again, which is what I always tell my clients. And it's just a memory. So tell him to get out of here. So I did. You get out of here. Go away. I don't want you to come back here again. Um, you did a terrible thing. And, um, and you lied about it to my grandmother and my mother. You said you didn't do it. And um, I don't want to see you again. And, and the left, he left. The form left. And I laid in the bed, scared to death. The kid was just scared to death. And I laid there for about 20 minutes. And um, so then finally my adult said to her, you know, you could get up now. There's nobody in the house and he's gone. And isn't that wonderful that you release that from your unconscious? So you released your incest complex, which I had been working on for a long time. Um, when I started to tell you that story, sure. I, I think I had been working on that with her about a year or two when I finally did the neck thing. So, see, when you when you have a trauma like that, it goes into your unconscious in pieces like a puzzle. And so you get one piece. You know, you get the piece of the room and you get the piece of the neck. And, and I realized I was laying on a cot and I was turning this way and it was oral sex that was happening. So that's how I turned and and that's how the incest happened. So I have that in my first book, um, You're Not Finished Yet, uh, How You Can Remember an Incest Memory, because it's very important for people to be able to do that. Otherwise, um, you know, they don't like sex. They have problems with sex in their marriage. And, you know, you have to integrate all of that. Um, that's part of developing your soul. It would seem from your story that nothing is really lost at the level of the soul. Everything is actually there, even, I presume, past life memories. Oh, I love that. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's what Jung said, that past life were, were um, outside uh, your unconscious, and they would come in at different times in dreams or, you know, different images you would get or articles you read or if you saw a movie um, you had a client that came in one day after the Titanic and she was hysterical. She said, I know I died on the Titanic and blah, blah, blah. I said, all right, all right. Well, you're alive now. Come on in. And, um, you know, so yeah, I believe in reincarnation. I believe we've lived before. You mentioned earlier the a notion of the psychic chill. Let's talk about that. Okay. So sometimes I get this chill and I know 
I know that it's important and it's important memory for me that I, that I share with people. And then somebody, maybe my client is talking and, um, and I know, Oh, I, that's, that's something I've had to go back to because I felt chilled there. So I think spirit delights help me, uh, with clients in the room, whether they're mine or the clients. Um, and the psychic chill, um, is something that they say happens when spirits are trying to give you a message. I recall the the first time I experienced that sort of a psychic chill. I was in third grade, and uh, one of my fellow classmates, uh, Lee Rosenthal <laughs> was his name, gave a book report on uh, the search for Bridie Murphy. And uh, I remember he said, this book uh, suggests that we lived before we were born. And as soon as he said that, I, I felt like an electric chill running up and down my spine. That's right. <laughs> it's happened about three or four other times in my life. And each time it's occurred, it struck me that this is, this is something very important that I need to pay attention to. Yes, your spirits would like you to investigate that, I think. Karen Herrick, this has been a uh, very fascinating interview. You've uh, really done quite a bit in your career to integrate uh, some of the most, uh, the lowest, the darkest moments in a person's life with some of uh, the highest, most insightful, joyful moments. Yes, that's what life's all about. Well, thank you so much for being with me. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure and a treat to be interviewed by you. And for those of you watching, thank you for being with us.